I don't know about y'all, but I'd rather Eric keep leading us in song. <laughs> Talking about some gather, pray, eat. That's my anthem right there. That's my jam. That's what's up. Y'all enjoy that Christian chicken? Yeah, one hope knows how to feed you, Jack. So honored to be here. So honored to have been invited to share with you guys today. Um, be invited by... Um, Joel, I used to think he was my friend. There are two things that argue against that. Number one, he's invited me to address the subject of God's character, faith alone, the exclusivity of Christ, and justice in one sermon. (laughs) Friends don't make friends preach four sermons in one. I'm thrilled to be here with you. You got your Bibles. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. I won't be long. I got to get out of the way. I don't know. Anybody here from North Carolina? All right. My people's back there. Anybody here from places where people go camping? None of the black people raise their hands on that. (laughs) Black people don't go camping. I don't know what y'all doing in them woods out there. Stories told this little black boy in North Carolina who decided he wanted to go camping and went and told his friends, I've been getting into camping, been reading camping magazines, and I'm about to go to the the camping store and buy some camping gear. And all his friends told him one by one, man, black people don't go camping. But he was undeterred. He read some beautiful things about the mountains in North Carolina and decided he was going to go camping. So sure enough, he He got his car and loaded up his car with his camping gear, and all by himself, he drove up into the mountains of North Carolina and found the backwoods and headed off into a little park where he could camp and went out there. It was nighttime by the time he got there, so he set up his tent, set up his camp, started a little fire, and he, just like he dreamed, he laid back on the soft grass and put his elbows behind his head and looked up into the night sky, clear, beautiful, stars twinkling. And as he lay there, he heard something kind of rustling, like leaves or something crinkling off in the distance. He didn't pay it no mind. He laid there a little bit more. And as he lay there, he heard the rustling getting louder. And pretty soon he heard what sounded like horse hooves. Growing louder and louder to the earth seemed like it was trembling. He, he set up about that point. And he, now he's not hearing leaves, but he's hearing branches break off. <laughs> and some snorting. By this time, he's on his feet and he's looking and busting out of the woods. This big old black bear just coming down, just beating the ground, coming at him, snorting, trees breaking and falling. And and on the back of this bear is a man who was six foot, 12 inches tall, wild hair, patched over one eye. And in his hand, he got a rattlesnake riding that bear, whipping that bear, just driving that bear, riding that bear. He comes up into the camp, jumps off the bear, punches the bear in the head. The bear falls out cold, walks over to the fire, puts his hand in the fire, takes a mess Metal coffee tin off the fire, drank it hot and black, squeezed the can, threw it down, went over there, and kicked the bear, woke the bear up, got his snake, got up on the bear, and he looked at the camp. He said, I got to be going. There's a bad man coming behind me. <laughs> Shailene is next, so I got to get out the way. It's a bad man coming behind me. Ephesians chapter 2, this is the kind of story country folks tell, all right? No animals were hurt in the preparation of that story. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. This is God's word. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. 
But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Father, we thank you for your holy word, your authoritative, inspired, sufficient word. We thank you that by it we we live, Lord. We live not by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. And we thank you that your word is alive, it is active, it's sharp. Even now, Lord, we pray and trust your word will be dividing our thoughts and our intents. And we thank you that your word does not return void. It accomplishes what you send it to do. Your word falls upon us like water on the earth, and it brings forth bud and fruit. So would you have your way? Cause this word of yours to bear fruit in every heart today. Cause it to bear fruit that remains and redounds to your glory. Give us hearing ears, Holy Spirit. Help us to forget what we think we know. And maybe hear something fresh again. Speak to us, O Lord, your servants listen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2, well-known passage in the Bible. Great passage to go at a conference um, where we're thinking about faith alone, justification by faith alone. And though I have four sermons to deliver in this one, I'm only going to give you three. The other one you got to work out on your own time. Give you three as best I can in the form of these three points. Number one. Apart from faith, fallen man is dead and destined for wrath. Apart from faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, fallen man is dead and destined for wrath. We'll see that in verses 1 to 3. Number two, justification by faith alone is possible only because of God's character. Justification by faith alone is possible only because of God's character, which we'll see in verses 4 to 9. And number three, God's character in justifying faith is exactly what our neighborhoods need. God's character in justifying faith is exactly what our neighborhoods need. I missed a planning call among the speakers earlier this year. Maybe it was late last year. If you ever invited to a conference and there's a planning call, don't miss it. That's when they give you assignments you didn't know you were going to have. And I was told that my task was to try and connect God's character with this doctrine of justification by faith alone at a conference whose aim is to encourage people who are ministering and laboring in contexts like the neighborhood we're in, contexts like the neighborhood that I serve in. And so I'm going to try and connect those things, God's character, faith alone, and our neighborhoods. Amen? All right, y'all pray for me. So the first point, apart from faith, fallen man is dead in sin and destined for wrath. Look again at verses 1 to 3. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Sometimes the Bible just plain. It just says it flat. Notice now, Paul's writing to Christians, and he says to Christians, you, you and me, beloved, were dead in trespasses and sins in which we once walked. In other words, the habit of our lives 
was sin and trespasses. The habit of our lives was to go contrary to the limits that God had set in his word. Indeed, the limits that God had placed upon creatures. We were accustomed to busting off the restraints of God and going our own way. And the consequence of that was death. Had been since Adam in the garden. Here now we have in view a spiritual death. A separation from God. And this is what's so deceiving, so tricky about this death. We're accustomed to thinking about physical death, and a, and a foolish sinner will think, well, I didn't drop dead when I did that. I must keep going. I didn't die right away, so it must be all right. God didn't strike me down, so I must have got away with it. All the while, foolish in our pride, spiritually dead in sin. And this is our biography, beloved. Right here in the Bible. We were dead in trespasses and sins in which we once walked. We were dead men walking. On the way to the execution. It's a marvelous thing to be dead in sin and trespasses. Dead people are powerless. They don't will They don't feel, they don't act or do, they're dead, immobile, lifeless. And so we were spiritually dead in sin. And notice not only dead in sin, but dominated by an unholy trinity. Notice there, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. Paul, in so many words there, is naming the the three forces with which we do spiritual warfare. The world, the flesh, and the devil. That we were following the world. Its way of thinking, its way of living, its value system. And we were following the prince of the power of the air. We were following this this spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And we were obeying our passions and our lusts. The thoughts that we had that were unpleasing to God. The desires, the appetites that were displeasing to God. We were slaves to them all. Dominated by them, following them gladly. This unholy trinity of the world, the flesh, and the devil was was our master, and we were enslaved to it. But we were happy slaves. Yes, sir, boss. Whatever you like, boss. I'm happy to serve, boss. Don't you realize that a life of sin is a certain kind of suicide? It's a slavery and a suicide. And that's who we were. Slaves to sin. Killing ourselves. Notice now. With our own pleasures. So deceitful is sin. We kill ourselves with our pleasures. We were dead in sin. We were dominated by an unholy trinity. And notice at the end of verse 3, we were deserving of God's wrath. Paul writes there, we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. I, I love this little phrase here. Because I think it cures the self-righteousness that we Christians sometimes grow into. You know, you can be Christian, you can be a Christian for a while, long enough that you forget that you were dead in sin and trespasses. You you can be a Christian long enough that you forget what it was like to be enslaved to your sinful desires and your passionate lusts. We can be Christians long enough that we forget even that there's a spiritual warfare going on with a real devil. But Paul here says, now we were by nature children of wrath Like the rest of mankind. In other words, don't start tripping like you're different from the rest of the world. 
You weren't a different kind of human being with a higher level of virtue and morality. You were like the rest of mankind who were by birth into sin, destined for the righteous, holy, eternal judgment of God. We need a church that has bifocals on. I don't even know if they make bifocals anymore. They call them progressives now or something. You gotta tilt your head the right way to see stuff. I think that's how that works. But we need, we need a pair of lenses that helps us to see in twos, so to speak. That on the one hand, this was our past tense. We were these things if we are Christians. We have been saved from these things if we are Christians. But on the other hand, we see ourselves as not unlike those people who are not yet saved. Who share the same infirmity, the same weakness, the same corruption. Who shared the same manner of life before we met Jesus. This is important because I think if you forget what it was like not to know Jesus, in some way, you lose the capacity to relate to people who don't know Jesus. And sometimes I think this is why Christians, we find it hard to share the gospel. We imagine we have nothing in common with the people we're sharing it with. But we were all together children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Start there. That's great common ground. That's great common ground. This is why the ground is level at the foot of the cross. It's because we were all children of wrath, deserving of God's holy judgment. So I take verses 1 to 3, in particular verse 3, to be a description of the Christians before Christ. One half of our spiritual biography, but it's also a description of the church's mission field. The people described in verses 1 to 3 are the people the church is called to reach with the gospel. And more than that, the people in verses 1 to 3 are the people the church is called to love. I see my brother pastor here, Dennis Washington, preached at our little church a few weeks ago on sharing the message of the gospel and was exhorting us so wonderfully. And Dennis has this really gracious, steady way, and he's got that New York cool in his preaching, right? You know, all his, bre- his bees are hard. Brooklyn, you know, and <laughs> from the Bronx, and, you know. And just when you were feeling all cozy and cared for, Dennis asked the question, do we even love the people we share the gospel with? Oh. Yeah, I heard the people on Zoom say, oh, too, right? <laughs> and I think this text, in its own way, begs us to recognize our commonality with the lost world. I think it beckons us, as we'll see in a moment, to love that world, to love those people, to share the gospel not merely out of a religious project that we check off, but to share the gospel like fellow fallen beings, like lepers who found a healing, like those who are starving who have found food. Beggars telling other beggars where to find bread. So notice what's happening in this first section here, that apart from faith, fallen man is in a desperate condition. He is dead in sin, dominated by his enemies, and destined for wrath. Notice point number two. That justification by faith is only possible because of God's character. Verse 4, God butts in. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love of which he loved us, 
even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so so that no one may boast. What do we learn about God's character here? I want to suggest at least three things. Notice in verse 4 that God is merciful. What is that he's merciful? In fact, the text says he's rich in mercy. You know what it is to be rich? That's somebody who got more than you. <laughs> A lot more than you. Someone who has a, a, an abundance of things, who, who's not in danger of being without, right? They have abundance, and, and God here is abundant now. He is rich. He is overflowing. He has unlimited capacity to be merciful. He's rich in mercy. He's not stingy with mercy. He's not failing and, 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 and faltering in mercy. He is rich in mercy, and it is, it is his merciful character that is part of the engine of the gospel. In mercy, God is treating us less than our sins deserve. He's punishing us less than our sins deserve. Notice what we were in verses 1 to 3, how appropriate it is that the first aspect of God's character is mercy here. Because in verses 1 to 3, we were running headlong toward wrath. We deserved that wrath. We had earned that wrath. If ever we could make a claim upon God, we could justly claim that he should punish us. But God, rich in mercy decides from eternity past to punish us less than we deserve. One thing Christians ought not be are grumblers. Not in light of God's mercy. Not in light of how little we have been punished given our transgressions. Not in light of how much God has richly given us in mercy. We ought not be grumblers. And if we are, we ought to be repenters. But notice now, there's a second aspect of God's character that's at work, that's propelling him in the gospel. Notice it's his love. But God, being rich in mercy, well, why is he merciful? Well, because of the great love with which he loved us. If there's ever, ever a word that needs to be dusted off and understood again? Isn't it love? Amen. We love everything. We love our spouses and our children and we love spaghetti. You know, we, <laughs> we love television shows and, you know, we, we love kids at school. I mean, you know, we just are indiscriminate in this notion of love. We just sort of spread it around until it's almost nothingness, isn't it? And we lie in the name of love and we promise in the name of love but never, never fulfill. Perhaps some of you young sisters and you young brothers know when you were dating and you dropped that L word just at the right time to elicit the appropriate response but you didn't mean it. God's not trifling like that though. If God tells you he loves you, he loves you. And so amazing is this. God isn't just talking about his love. The Bible says he demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's like, every day I got to prove my love. I'm going to send my son. Calvary's cross to endure the wrath that sinners deserve in order to demonstrate how much I love you, how effectively and thoroughly I love you, how, as the text says here, great is my love. 
It's love that drives God to redeem sinners and make them his children. And one more thing in this text. Notice also the constant reference to grace. Verse 5, by grace you have been saved. Again, then in verse 7, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own. It is the gift of God. Now we're at a point where we're thinking about God's character. We're thinking about the way in which God responds to us, not in mercy, which is to punish us less than our sins deserve, but in grace, which is to treat us better than our sins deserve. In the gospel, God's like, I got you. I'm not going to beat you. I'm going to hook you up. I'm going to treat you way better than you deserve. I'm going to give you way more than you could ever earn. And the quality, the nature of this grace is that it is unearned favor. Not of works, because you know what we would do. We would boast. We, We would boast. Some of us imagine that heaven is a boasting contest. How you get here, bruh? Man, I saved some kids from a burning building. What about you? What about you? I was faithful to my wife for 69 years. That's how I got here. Some of us imagine heaven as a boasting contest, but everybody talk about heaven ain't going. Especially if we think we're going based upon the things we have done. No. The text is clear. It calling God gracious. In, In saying that he is kind toward us. In making it even clear that even our faith is a gift to us, it is drawing our attention to this large-hearted, giving aspect of God's character. He's ever giving to undeserving people more than they could hope or imagine. So why, why, why is there even a gospel at all? Why is there even a way to be saved from sin and wrath and judgment and hell at all? The answer is not in us. The answer is in God's character. It is because he is rich in mercy, great in love, and rich in this giving grace. The Heidelberg Catechism reflects on this really well in questions 60 and 61. Question 60 asks this, how are you right with God? Right, that's the question about justification. How are we right with God? Answer, only by true faith in Jesus Christ. Even though my conscience accuses me of having grievously sinned against all God's commandments and of never having kept any of them, nevertheless, and even though I am still inclined toward all evil without my deserving at all, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ As if I had never sinned nor been a sinner. As if I had been perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me. Last line in that answer. All I need to do is to accept this gift of God with a believing heart. That's good news. You missed your place to shout. All the satisfaction, the propitiation, the turning away of God's wrath, all of the righteousness, the positive, perfect obedience to God, all of the holiness of Christ is ours by God's grace through faith. Such that all that Jesus is and all that Jesus has done has become mine through a medium called faith. I don't know if you can drink the water in Baltimore. I don't take no chances in D.C. I cook with it because I'm going to put it in a boiling pot. But that's a whole other story. So, but if you're going to get water, normally what do you have to do? You have to turn on the spigot, don't you? That's real country, spigot. <laughs> you got to turn on the faucet, right? And then water come out, don't it? 
It got from wherever it was in the sort of city, you know, municipal water sanitation place to my glass beneath the faucet. How? Well, via pipes. The grace of God is, and the salvation of God is a lot like water flowing from the sanitation department to my glass beneath the faucet. The grace of God travels through a, a, a pipe. The, the, the grace of God and the salvation of God comes to me through a pipe called faith. Your faith's not an action. It's a medium. It's a pathway. It's a pipeway by which all that Jesus is and all that Jesus does comes to you, flows into the cup of your soul, makes you new. That's what the catechism is teaching us. Question 61 is this. Why do you say that by faith alone you are right with God? It is not because of any value my faith has that God is pleased with me. Only Christ's satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness make me right with God. And I can receive this righteousness and make it mine in no other way than by faith alone. The catechism writer here is saying... As was said earlier, God's not even impressed with your faith. No, 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 no. And the text here, verse 8 says, God even gave you that faith. How are you going to be impressed with something you got that he gave you? (laughs) What foolishness is to boast in our faith. Boast in the God who gave you the faith. And notice now. There's no other way to receive Christ and all that Christ is and the salvation that God gives except by faith alone, apart from works, in the crucified, resurrected Savior. There's no other way. This is the language of exclusivity. There are not many roads that lead to God. There are not many channels that we can swim. There are not many mountains that we can climb and arrive at God. There is one. And praise God there is one. And the connection between faith in Christ and the character of God is is this. Because salvation is wholly owing to a God whose character is grace and mercy and generosity and love, it can only be by a faith that assumes what's really important is that God and not us. I'm going to try to say this a different way. The character of God necessitates that we be saved by faith alone, apart from works. If, if God's character is meant to be displayed in the gospel, and his character is one of rich grace and great love and, uh, and, 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 and mercy then it must be then that the the mechanism for receiving that salvation, the, 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 the channel for receiving that salvation, must be one that gives no credit to the one who is saved, but gives all credit and glory to the one who does the saving. And so then we must be saved by faith alone if we're going to be saved at all, because that way of being saved gives all the honor, praise, and glory to God, the one who does the saving. If the gospel is true, and it is, then only faith in Jesus brings us back to God in righteousness, and only faith in Jesus rescues us from the wrath that we so richly deserve. And it's that way of saving that glorifies God. So we've been thinking about God's character in the gospel and why it necessitates salvation by faith alone or justification by faith alone in Christ alone. Let's consider a third thing then. Why does all of this matter? Why why come to the hood and preach about ancient German ideas? Why take 500-year-old Reformation truths from England and Scotland and Germany? with men long dead and celebrate these things in neighborhoods of significant need. You realize that in the minds of many people, this is like the least relevant thing you could ever be talking about. I'm convinced the truth is the opposite. 
If it's one thing that hurting, overlooked, vulnerable people and neighborhoods need, it's a God who is merciful, loving, and giving. Think about what neglected and vulnerable neighborhoods often lack. Our neighborhoods can lack mercy, can't they? We see that in the violence in our communities. A certain merciless, mercilessness. We see that in certain predatory behaviors, whether child abuse or sexual abuse or domestic violence or drug dealing. People preying on others. And the code of the street says we must be hard. Can't be soft. We need to be ruthless, having no mercy on others because we're afraid we won't get any mercy ourselves. And it's not just the people in the neighborhoods who are merciless toward the people in the neighborhoods, but isn't it the truth that outside the neighborhoods, others look on the neighborhood with nothing resembling mercy? From business folks who won't put grocery stores in food deserts, to politicians who swing through for votes but then can't be seen again, to preachers who get a start with their churches in the neighborhood before they bounce and dip to the suburbs. There is a significant heart problem called mercilessness. That's so often true of needy communities. And our neighborhoods need a God who is merciful. Our neighborhoods also can lack love sometimes, can't they? Now, not completely. You can find amazing stories of love in the city, in the inner city, uh, the way mothers sacrifice for their children. Nobody loves more fiercely than a black mama or a Hispanic mama. I mean, it ain't racial. I didn't mean to racialize it. Just that my mama black, and I was thinking about it. Right? I trust your mama love you too, all right? So I'm going to fix that in the next sermon. <laughs> but, but, but think about the way neighbors sometimes watch out for each other. There's love in that, right? You know, the way they sometimes form block associations or neighborhood groups or, or the way Miss, Miss Patty, who's been in the neighborhood 65 years, watch out for your UPS packages before they get snatched, right? There's love in that. But there's also a lot of anti-love in our community. In tough neighborhoods, we have the opposite of 1 Corinthians 13 love, don't we? We see impatience, unkindness, envying, boasting, pride, rudeness, folks who are easily angered, resentment, boasting in the wrong we do, lying. People think that they must be loveless to most other people, because they fear they won't be loved in return. And sometimes the love we see in our neighborhoods, right? You know, we grew up, if, if, if one eat, we all eat, right? But the all is usually limited to about three, four, five people. And it's basically self-love spread out over a slightly wider area. It's not 1 Corinthians 13 love. And so what our neighborhoods most desperately, who our neighborhoods most desperately need to meet is a God who is rich in love. Nothing could be more needful than to meet this God who with great love loved us before the worlds began and who in great love gave his son for our salvation. And in his great love is still saving people. Indeed, pouring his love into our hearts until by the spirit we cry, Abba, Father. I mean, how do, you, how do you take a loveless people and make them loving people? Have you thought about that? Have you thought about how hard that is? To find someone who perhaps for decades have been conditioned into a kind of lovelessness, into a brittle heart, and to see that heart broken open and to find beneath the brittle and beneath the, the coal and the ash, flesh. How do you get flesh there that beats for other people? It's only in the new heart that the gospel gives. 
Nothing could be more needful than that our neighbors meet this God of love. And, and our neighborhoods can like generosity and giving too, can't they? We can like grace. Again, I, I get it. We give to those who are closest to us. But don't we normally just limit that to our crew? Everybody else has to get their own. No, my brother, you got to get your own from those late night record commercials to help with the rent. We close our fists tight when people come asking. We don't give generously because we fear we won't, we won't get from others when we are in our need. I, I think when it comes to mercy and love and grace or generosity, we, many of us in our neighborhoods, we, we live with a scarcity mentality, don't we? And so we need to meet that God who is abundant, super abundant in grace and mercy and love and whose abundance can change our scarcity and make us the kind of people who overflow with the grace, mercy, and love that he himself has. In in one sense, the gospel is about God taking his character and forming it in people unlike him. Renewing us in Christ, conforming us to his image. Displaying his glory, not just in the cross, but also in the church. This is marvelous. This is wonderful. That we are being renewed in the image of God. We are being renewed in the character of God. And we, by God's grace, might be the vessels that others come to know this God. And this I want to suggest, beloved, as I punt on my fourth sermon. (coughs) This I want to suggest is the basis of justice. That, that That the sort of foundation of justice and being a just people and working for justice in the society is a gospel foundation, which itself is further founded upon the character of God. That that justice is the outworking of God's character in the world, at least through God's people, and often through the the sort of echo of common grace and other institutions that God has established. So, So Dr. King had a wonderful way of putting this. He said, justice is love correcting everything that rebels against love. It is also at times grace Correcting everything that rebels against grace and mercy. Correcting everything that rebels against mercy. All of these things are siblings in the same family. Stitches in the same quilt. All of these things hang together like a cluster of grapes. So if we would be just people... And we would see the connection of justice to faith alone and Christ alone. All we need to do is look back beyond the faith to the God whose character decided that we should be saved by faith alone. For his character channeled to us through faith, worked out through us, through good works, as verse 10 puts it. His character is meant to be shown in public justice, not just personal piety. Much more we could say about that, but we'll stop there and we'll let that man come riding an even bigger bear. (laughs) Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your word, your wonderful word, your rich word, Your word which holds out to us everlasting hope. Lord, help the one who's despairing of ever being righteous in your sight by turning their eyes away from themselves to Christ, trusting him for his righteousness, hoping in him for salvation. And the one who feels crushed to the ground With no one to help, show yourself to them a merciful God 
rich in mercy, gracious in all of your ways, and grant them faith to trust in you. And the one who feels alone in the world, unloved, unnoticed, Lord, would you notice them even now? And would you give them a sense of your notice? Would you open their hearts to receive your love? To know that they will never be separated from your love in Christ Jesus. And as we think about going from this place back to our neighborhoods, whether in the suburbs or the inner cities, whether neighborhoods that people think are well-to-do or neighborhoods that people think are obviously broken, we, we know that in every neighborhood are sinners in need of grace. Some whose sins are obvious, some whose sins trail behind them. But Lord, we pray that you would save them before the day of judgment and that you would make us faithful to share your gospel with one and all. Help us, O Lord, to be faithful, to bear witness, to speak of the the way in which you saved us from wrath and speak of the way in which you still save others from wrath through the propitiation of your son and faith in him. Do this for your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen.